supporters are fast moving. Unlike other big rallies, the a bit earlier at about 7 a.m., a group from the Coast Guard. Welcome to Hashtag VH Vote 2013. Today on Rappler, the Supreme Court declares the pork barrel system unconstitutional. Justice Antonio Carpio says the DAP has been implemented without the president's written approval since 2011. First, how do you rebuild Leyte and Samar? Oh, don't build where well, don't build what is destroyed because that means there is there. So you're building back better elsewhere. And uh, by Governor Joey Salceda tells shattered communities stop self pity and start rebuilding. Hello, I'm Ai Makaraig, sitting in for Maria Ressa. Welcome to Rappler, your social news network. The Supreme Court declares legislators' Priority Development Assistance Fund, or Pork Barrel, unconstitutional. Supreme Court spokesman Ted Tess says the vote against the PDAF is 14-0. Associate Justice Presbitero Velasco Jr. inhibited from the case because his son is a congressman. Justice Antonio Carpio earlier called the PDAF in the 2013 budget, quote, illegal on its face because it made the identification of a lawmaker's project mandatory rather than recommendatory. Carpio says the 2013 General Appropriations Act violated the Constitution when it gave cabinet secretaries the president's power to realign savings and required the concurrence of Congress to release funds. In its decision, the court says the pork barrel system violates the principle that legislative power cannot be delegated because legislators are given the authority to appropriate personal discretionary funds. With the Supreme Court decision, the temporary restraining order on the PDAF imposed in September is now permanent. The remaining 2013 allocations will be returned to the government's coffers. Ahead of the decision, both chambers of Congress waived their right to their frozen PDAF for 2013 and authorized the president to use it as a calamity fund. The high court also strikes down as illegal provisions in two laws that allow the president to use the Malampaya Fund and the President's Social Fund or PSF for purposes beyond the mandate of the funds. In its decision, the court stops the release of money from the Malampaya Fund that is not for energy projects or activities. The justices also stop the release of parts of the PSF used to finance priority infrastructure development projects. The court's decision is a response to several petitions questioning the PDAF's constitutionality in the wake of the pork barrel scam where lawmakers allegedly funneled their funds to fake NGOs in exchange for kickbacks. On the first day of oral arguments on the constitutionality of the government's disbursement acceleration program or DAP, Senior Associate Justice Antonio Carpio says the Budget Department has been implementing the DAP without the written approval of the President since 2011. Bayan Muna Party List Representative Carlos Zarate says the Department of Budget and Management or DBM issued the National Budget Circular 541 in July 2012 which allowed DBM to with withdraw unobligated allotments and use them to cover additional funding for existing projects, augment existing programs, and fund priority projects not considered in the 2012 budget. Carpia says the DBM circular validated what was done in 2011 when DAP was introduced. The executive justifies the DAP as a government spending booster program, but critics say it expanded the president's constitutional powers to realign savings to fund items not in the budget laws of 2012 and 2013. Former Senator Joker Arroyo calls the DAP an invention of the DBM after Senator Jingoy Estrada said extra funds were given to senators who voted to convict former Chief Justice Renato Corona. The funds came from the DAP, but the government denies it was a bribe. Petitioner Manuel Lazaro says the power to appropriate funds lies with Congress, not with the DBM. Zarate adds the DAP constitutes presidential pork with a discretion for its disbursement lying in the president through the DBM. In his interpolation of Zarate, Justice Marvik Leonen points out Zarate is attacking the DBM circular, which is valid only for 2012. 
The Onan also hits petitioner lawyer Raymond Fortune for his opening statement where he talked about the possible impeachment of Supreme Court justices in relation to DAP and the alleged use of DAP to bribe senators. Leonan asked Fortune if this was a threat. He tells Fortune, do you think that is necessary? Will the court rule in your favor because of fear? Some justices also ask whether the petition is premature. Leonan says there has been no proof there were irregularities in the use of the funds. He adds, it is not this court that should act as the commission on audit. Your allegations might be happening, we do not know. But in order for us to find out, we have to know the facts. Chief Justice Maria Lourdes Sereno makes the same comment, adding petitioners must identify which specific items had irregularities. The next oral arguments will be heard on December 10. It's now day 11 since Typhoon Yolanda, international name Haiyan, hit the Philippines. As of Tuesday, six more people are added to the death toll. 3,982 people are now confirmed dead. At least 1,602 people are still missing. The National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council says more than 10 million people are affected by the typhoon. The world's most powerful storm left at least 11 billion pesos worth of damages in agriculture and infrastructure. Food and other supplies reach survivors as roads are cleared to make relief deliveries faster and communication lines are restored. International aid is still pouring in. As of Tuesday, total foreign aid pledged stands at 12 billion pesos or 295 million dollars. After aid reaches all municipalities of Leyte, the struggle shifts to, restore, to restoring normalcy to the lives of the people there. But that will be hard to do without electricity. But there no Esmaquel reports. For the first time in over a week, 8-year-old JB Gonzalez can breathe easier. JB had an asthma attack when Super Typhoon Yolanda struck. But for 10 days, his family couldn't find a place to plug his nebulizer. JB's mother, Henedina, brings him to one of the few charging stations near the Tacloban City Hall. Kailangan talagang kuryente namin para sa kanya. Kasi mga, mga, mga dumibal sa ano, paligid. Like JB, over 4 million people in the eastern Visayas region suffer from a power blackout. The government vows to restore electricity by Christmas Eve. To bring back power, President Benigno Aquino says the government might use the controversial Malampaya Fund. The fund is an alleged source of corruption. The Supreme Court temporarily stopped its release. In one of the issues is something like one, over 150 transmission towers of the national grid have, uh, have been damaged. Now the question is how do you pay for that? So I've tasked um, the, my legal counsel to study whether or not Palampaya would be the better avenue to restore this state asset. If you remember, the transmission lines are in effect just leased to the concessionaire and their state asset. In areas that Yolanda devastated, the challenge goes beyond restoring power. Tacloban Mayor Alfred Ramaldes asks the national government to quickly restore essential services. I think we uh, na natin the building code, we na natin yung zoning, ano ba lahat ito. But first things first, let's attend to our people, let's uh, shelter them, let's give them food. For the government, Rebuilding after Yolanda remains a logistical nightmare. But for people like JB, it spells survival. Paterno S. Makel Rappler, Tacloban City. With Typhoon Haiyan washing off medicines and damaging hospitals, much-needed medical aid from overseas is in Tacloban to tend the wounded. Bea Kupin reports. Different flags, countries, cultures. International aid continues to pour into Central Philippines. The Japanese, too, have returned. They were once kicked out of Leyte in World War II by the forces of U.S. General Douglas MacArthur. The Japanese International Cooperation Agency has an ace up their sleeve. Filipino-speaking deputy team leader Shigehiro Matsuda. Una-una, uh, malakas kasi ang relasyon uh, ng Hapon at uh, Pilipinas. So, siguro wala kami choice 
なヒンディープープンとヒンディートゥルンガンアンマがあのあ海ビーガンフィリピーノ With Shigehiro and other translators, the Japanese go around Tacloban and towns devastated by Yolanda. Ilang beses ako nakapunta sa ano Tacloban City, kaya siyempre alam ko kung gaano yung lugar na ito, kaya talaga ano malungkot ako noong nakita ko ang kalagayan. For a team of firemen from France, giving aid is a little more difficult. Some do not speak English. The firemen team up with another group from France, Doctors Without Borders. We saw that there is an MSF. MSF is a large international uh, organization, um, which is French. So it's more, the language is more easy. So we contact us and they, uh, they are just uh, beside to do a new hospital. Doctors Without Borders will construct an inflatable hospital within the week to fill the vacuum left behind by the now paralyzed Bethany Hospital. The foreigners aren't just from Europe and America. Turkey, a nation at the crossroads of Asia and Europe, also has nationals here. Ismail and his team rushed to Takloban right after they heard about Yolanda. Şöyle dünyanın birçok yerinde deprem gördük, sel gördük, tsunami gördük. Fakat bir tayfunun bu kadar fazla zarar verebileceğini gerçekten biz hiç beklemiyorduk. Daha küçük bir olay olduğunu tahmin ediyorduk ama gördük ki afetin boyutunun çok geniş ve çok güçlü olduğunu gördük. The NGO from Turkey will send 300 tents to Takloban. 12 doctors are also on their way here. Coğrafya çok uzak olmasına rağmen Türkiye'ye dünyanın herhangi bir yerinde insanlık bir felaket bir zorluk gördüğü zaman biz millet olarak hemen oraya koşmaya yardım etmeye çalışıyoruz. Shigehiro studied in UP Diliman for two years. He says he's amazed to see the Filipino spirit is so resilient. Yung mga people talagang ano malakas, resilient, may ano niti pa sa mukha nila. So medyo ano relief na ako. Beko Pin Rappler, Tacloban. With massive reconstruction needed after the super typhoon, Albay Governor Joey Salceda says it's time for affected communities to stop self-pity and start rebuilding. Speaking from experience, as the governor of a province frequently visited by calamities like storms and lahar flows, Salceda suggests steps toward rebuilding. He says relief distribution should be systematic and fast. Salceda also says it's important to have a national conductor of relief efforts, but local officials should mobilize as well. Salceda says it's better to give victims money instead of food because this gives them the option to choose what to eat and the power to spend. Trust the locals, and um, cash is the best form of relief. Uh, trust them, you know, they will not steal from their own. So in other words, you can give them the money for building, they can build their own houses once the location has been, uh, has been selected. How much is needed for reconstruction? Based on past disasters like typhoons on Doi and Peping, Salceda says $14 billion is needed. He suggests a donor pledging session where international organizations and foreign governments can signify their donations. I think with a good, better governance now in the Philippines, I think we could. Uh, I think uh, there, there's, there's, uh, there are incentives for donating mm -hmm. in the Philippines in uh, mobilizing international generosity, um, especially those who don't want to pay up on in war. So I think we'll be paying here. So essentially, that gives them a chance. For the As the devastated areas begin rehabilitation, Salceda says it's important to build better, durable infrastructure on higher ground. Um, first, how do you rebuild Leyte and Samar? Oh, don't build where don't build what is destroyed, because that means the risk is there. Yes. So you're building back better elsewhere. For that, and then you need geostrategic intervention because this is a nice chance to build a new Leyte, a new Warai nation, or a new Tacloban city. A new Asked about the government's preparations before the typhoon struck, Salceda says there were problems translating the warnings into impacts. Thanks. Uh, Warning-wise, I think perfect. Yeah. Um, in terms of the impacts, though, translating the warnings into impacts and exposure. When you say impacts, what will it mean? Like, uh, to some people, they didn't. They thought it's just the strong winds plus floods. 
so they missed out on the storm so surge. True. But in my province, for example... The typhoon blocked roads, cut communication lines, and crippled local officials' disaster response. Salceda says the national government should have then stepped in earlier. The conclusion that the, um, the LGUs cannot take on their appropriate jobs, I think uh, immediately the national government should have come in, bring in all the trucks, restore law and order, restore all the communications, since it can be reached by land yes. through Matnog. And virtually not. You can still help survivors of the typhoon by sending donations in cash and kind. Rappler has a list of ongoing relief efforts both here and abroad. Survivors need more food and supplies like rice, water, canned goods, clothes, toiletries, and medicines. Take a look at Rappler's list to see how you can help. Every little action counts. It's been 11 days since the super typhoon, but more than 1,000 people are still missing. For Filipinos in Hong Kong, waiting for news about their loved ones is difficult to bear. Natasha Gutierrez reports. Inisip po, kawawa doon sila eh. Wala silang kakain nga daw doon. Wala naman sila, man, nalalamigan sila. Wala daw sila mga damit. Mga ng mga, oo, mga kapitbahay ko. Tapos doon lang sila sa tabi-tabi. Sally can't sleep, eat, or work. It's been 11 days since Super Typhoon Haiyan battered her home province, Iloilo. She says her coastal town of Barangay Agdaliran, San Dionisio, Iloilo, is completely wiped out. Her house destroyed. Her mother and the rest of her family are safe, but she has yet to hear from her youngest brother. Eliseo, a father of three, was near the shore when the typhoon struck. Sana po, buhay lang siya. Sana nakasampay lang siya sa ibang isla. Tapos uuwi lang siya sa pamilya niya kasi inaantay siya ng mga anak niya po, ma'am. Helpless in Hong Kong, where she's a domestic worker, Sally is one of many Filipinos who constantly worry about family. Hong Kong is home to 180,000 Filipinos, 91% of whom are domestic workers. Many of them come from eastern Visayas, the region most battered by Haiyan. The typhoon left almost 4,000 dead and 4 million displaced. Some areas there, including Sally's remote village, went for days without aid. Sana man lang mabigyan kami doon ng mga, mga tao doon. Kawawa man, walang makakain. Dapat sana makarating naman doon ng tulong ng ibang bansa. Ma Naman sila doon kahit kunti lang. The consulate partners with the Hong Kong Red Cross to provide help in dealing with emotional distress. Actually, a lot of them are quite sad because um, some of them has um, started using our tracing service. They are looking for several family members, like two sons, two daughters, a husband, as well as their parents. And of course, they must be very worried and sad when they're waiting for the news. Philippine Consul General Noel Servigon says the Filipinos turn to each other for comfort, support, and news. The number one concern was finding family. The Philippine consulate here says it received about 30 calls from OFWs reporting names of missing family. In my 25 years uh, as a foreign service officer, uh, whenever we had uh, uh, meetings or whenever we had to deal with uh, disasters like this, we have uh, learned that uh, the number one concern of overseas Filipinos is the communication. They want to know the status of their family members, their relatives, their loved ones, their friends. The consulate forwards names reported by OFWs to the Department of Foreign Affairs to help trace family members. The DFA then coordinates with other agencies on the ground. As for Sally, she cries herself to sleep every night. Her employer has bought her a ticket home so she can look for her missing brother. She says she wants to at least find his body so she can say goodbye. Sally is only one of many Filipinos who continue to search for their loved ones. It's been almost two weeks since Typhoon Haiyan, but pain persists as the chance of finding the missing becomes dimmer and dimmer. Natasha Gutierrez, Rappler, Hong Kong. The daughter of late U.S. President John F. Kennedy presents her credentials to Japan's emperor in her new role as U.S. Ambassador to Japan. On Tuesday, Caroline Kennedy arrives at Tokyo's Imperial Palace to meet the emperor. Her arrival comes on the same week as the 50th anniversary of the assassination of her father. John F. Kennedy fought against Japan during World War II but later hoped to make a state visit. 
Speaking to a Senate committee in September, Caroline Kennedy says she would be humbled to carry her father's legacy and, quote, represent the powerful bonds that unite our two democratic societies. But some political analysts question her credentials, saying she has no background in foreign affairs and is a political neophyte. Let's now look at Rappler's Wrap for today, a list of the 10 most important events around the world you shouldn't miss. At number 7, Japanese nuclear engineers prepare to move uranium and plutonium fuel rods at Fukushima, an important step in the plant's decommissioning plan, two years after a tsunami smashed into the power plant. Operator Tokyo Electric Power will also have to remove the misshapen cores of three reactors that went into meltdown. TEPCO says the entire operation is scheduled to run for more than a year, but the full decommissioning is likely to take decades. At number 9, controversial Toronto Mayor Rob Ford is stripped of many of his powers after a heated city council debate. The Guardian reports the meeting comes on the heels of the mayor's recent drug abuse revelations and allegations of drunk driving and meeting with a prostitute. Although the city council cannot remove Ford from office unless he is convicted of a crime, it can clip some of his powers as mayor, like cutting his office budget by 60% and taking away his power to chair the council's executive committee. This comes after a chaotic meeting where Ford heckled the public and knocked over a council member as he charged at the gallery. And at number 10, Private firms are selling spying tools and mass surveillance technologies to nations in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. The Guardian reports, research by watchdog Privacy International showed how firms peddled spying capabilities at private trade fairs. Mass surveillance capabilities are associated with Britain's GCHQ and the U.S. National Security Agency. One firm offers massive passive monitoring equipment, while some cameras are hidden in cola cans, bricks, or children's car seats. Another manufacturer turns cars into surveillance control centers. For the full top 10, visit Rappler.com's The Wrap. Macau is getting ready to stage what could be the biggest boxing fight of 2013, Manny Pacquiao versus Brandon Rios. Natasha Gutierrez files this video blog. Fight week preparations are in full swing here in Macau for one of the biggest boxing fights of the year, tagged as Clash in Kotai, as Filipino superstar Manny Pacquiao faces off with young and feisty fighter Brandon Rios. Both fighters arrive Monday evening, six days before their scheduled clash. Both will stay at the majestic Venetian, the site of the bout Sunday, November 24, local time. International media also trickles in as fight week officially begins. At the airport, Pacquiao says he is more than confident, even if he is going up against a fighter seven years his junior. The Pac-Man is coming off two losses and needs to prove he is still relevant to the boxing world. I enter this fight stronger than ever. I have the strength of my country and my people coursing through my body. I fight for them, not for me. I fight for their glory, not mine. His trainer, Freddie Roach, says he doesn't see Rios making it past the fourth round. Rio says he's ready for the most important fight of his life. Manny Pacquiao is a big step. I am going to shut everyone up and prove I am the best. I know we are in Manny's backyard and I want to win every round. I have trained not to give up a minute to Manny Pacquiao. Rio's trainer Robert Garcia is confident his boxer will trigger Pacquiao's early retirement. He says, I guarantee you this will be the last time you ever see Manny Pacquiao on an HBO pay-per-view. One of these camps will soon be eating their words. Rios and Pacquiao will have more formal grand arrivals tonight here at the Venetian to greet fans who have come from across the world to witness the fight. With everything on the line for both fighters, it looks to be a bout that could well make boxing history. Natasha Gutierrez, Rappler, Macau. Every story on Rappler has a mood meter which gives you eight emotions to choose from. Click how you feel and your vote comes down to the mood navigator in the middle of the front page which crowdsources the mood of the day. It also gives you the top 10 stories that got the most clicks. Today's mood navigator is about politics and disaster. Aquino Romualdez trade barbs over Haiyan has 44% of people feeling angry, 26% annoyed. 
Petilia, the energy secretary, says, I'll resign if no power by Christmas has 52% of people feeling happy, 23% inspired. But the story that got the most clicks is the much-awaited Supreme Court decision. SC junks PDAF as unconstitutional, 89% happy, 5% inspired. All contributing to the mood of the day, today most people are happy. That's Rappler's newscast for today, Tuesday, November 19, 2013. Visit Rappler.com and watch your newscast Monday to Friday. Tell us how you feel on our mood meter and help us crowdsource the mood of the day. I'm Ayi Makaraig and as we say at Rappler, tomorrow begins today.